Well, happy 4th of July, everybody, tomorrow. And uh, we're going to get onto that theme in just a minute, but just start out like this. You know, a little boy was uh, bragging to his friend one 4th of July. He said, you know, my great-grandfather fought with Napoleon. My grandfather fought with the French. My father fought with the Americans. And his friend said, wow, your family doesn't get along with anybody, do they? Then a teacher was teaching the kids in the, in the classroom, and she said, you know, over 200 years ago, our forefathers defeated the British Army. And one of the little boys replied, wow, they must have really been strong. Just four guys beat a whole army. Forefathers, did you get that, follow that? And then one more teacher was teaching, and, and she was uh, asking one of the students, little Tommy, do you know where our ancestors signed the Declaration of Independence. And he said, at the bottom? I think you got it right. So uh, anyway, I guess you had to be paying attention to get that one. But uh, last Sunday afternoon, as I began to work on this Sunday's message, and that's kind of how the rhythm works for me, uh, I knew that I had bitten off more than I could chew uh, from the very start. And there's a couple of reasons for that. But talk about bitten, biting off more than you can chew. That's a metaphor, you know, that we use. I had a friend, actually one of my roping buddies when I was in college. And, uh, you know, sometimes we would fatten some of those old roping calves, you know, and then butcher them and, and uh, eat them. And, but they were often very tough. And, and the way he described it was, you know, when you take a bite of that calf, the longer you chew it, the bigger it gets. That's what, kind of what it felt like. Well, that's how I felt like last Sunday afternoon, that I'd bitten off more than I could chew. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, for one reason, today's passage is extremely familiar. In fact, it may be one of the most familiar passages in the whole Bible because it was a sermon, part of a sermon, that Jesus probably repeated often. And that makes some of us who attempt to be preachers kind of feel good about ourselves. You know, when you repeat a message, well, Jesus did too. And he had this theme that he would keep going back to and keep going back to. And because of that, it's a familiar theme. So one of my ag teachers in college used to say, you know, familiarity breeds contempt. Well, as an ag student, I didn't even know what that last word meant then. But uh, then I went to a seminary and got all educated. But familiarity breeds contempt. When we've heard something before, it's so easy for us just to check out. All right, I already know what we're talking about. I'll check out and start worrying about what we're going to have for lunch. Well, I hope you don't do that today because this passage today is one of those passages that's extremely familiar. But it begins with these words. You know, in the King James, it would have said, those who have ears to hear, hear. And what he's saying is, hey, guys, listen up. Listen again. So for... For one of the things I've been off more I can choose because of the familiarity, you know, just like, you know, Martin Luther King's speech, I have a dream. We're all familiar with that. We've heard that. Uh, John F. Kennedy's speech, ask not what you can do for your country, but what, uh, what your country can do for you. I got it all backwards, didn't I? Ask not what you can, your country can do for you, but what, for what your country... Does somebody want the mic? Y'all, why don't y'all just do this for me? <laughs> and then there was Abraham Lincoln's. Which one do you think I'm thinking about? Four score and seven years? The real familiar passages, aren't they? Well, this that we're going to read in just a minute is that familiar to you. But let's not check out. Here's the other reason why I knew that I'd bitten off more than I could chew. It has one of the hardest statements that Jesus ever made. Hardest in that for us to really live up to the standard, it's like, in fact, it's the reason why I named this message what I did. Unless if you want to put that up there, I, oh, it's not going to work. Oh, there it is. Are you kidding me? It's working? No. <laughs> no, it's, uh, are you kidding me? And we're going to read a statement by Jesus. We've heard it so often before, but if we let it seek in, honestly, deep inside, our response could be that. Are you kidding me? And so let's do. Look with me, if you would, Luke chapter 6. We're going to put that up on the screen as well. And those of you who have ears to hear, you can hear. And those of you who have eyes that are good enough to see, then you can read along with me there 
as I read this passage. Otherwise, you can look it up in your own Bible and do it that way, okay? But remember, here's what Jesus started out. But if you who are listening, okay, let's listen. Let's listen to these words, very words that Jesus spoke. It goes like this. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Just let that one seek in. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other side. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks. And if he takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Was I right? Real familiar, is it not? But these statements, the, those three words, love your enemies. And I just got to looking down through all the elements of those and bless those who curse you and mistreat you and slap you on the cheek. That's a metaphor for if someone insults you. Just let them keep on insulting. Don't even interrupt them. And someone takes your coat. Mm. Anybody in the room besides me ever had anything of yours taken by someone without their permission? Yeah. I, th I thought back this week, when, when was the first time that happened to me? And uh, it was when I was in college, and I'd saved up, and I bought a brand new pair of spurs. And I was so proud of those spurs, I wanted everybody to see them, so guess where I put them? I hung them on the gun rack in my truck. <laughs> and so there my spurs were for everyone to see in the gun rack in my truck. It was the first day that I had them. Went to a rodeo that night and uh, left them in the truck. It wasn't, wasn't time yet to wear them, put them on. And uh, when I went back to my truck to get my spurs, guess what? No more spurs. They were gone. Now, I assure you, a number of things came to my mind. But one of them was, oh no, I wish I had been here. I would have given him my rope can too. <laughs> but that's what Jesus said when someone takes from you. Then I remember I left my truck parked at the rope pen where we practiced. It's there on Front Street in Tyler. And it's a busy street. And I thought nothing of it. And my roommate and I had gone to a rodeo that night. Got back late in the middle of the night and got in my truck and turned the key on. And guess what? Nothing. Nothing. I thought, oh no, what's wrong with my truck? So I got out and opened the hood and went, and my battery was gone. <laughs> now a lot of things came to mind, but this wasn't one of them. Shoot, I wish the guy was still here. I would ask him if he wants the wheels and tires too. <laughs> Guys, that's what Jesus says in this passage that we not sleep through. This is the extent to which he is asking us, telling us, commanding us love your enemy and these are hard sayings you know uh, on a grand scale or on a personal scale this is really hard to do that's why I named this message are you kidding me well uh, let's uh, think about it in these terms as a little girl um, how many of y'all know Buckner Fanning he was a pastor at Trinity Baptist Church for like 38 years. He was our pastor, my pastor. Loved Buckner. He passed away a couple of months ago. And, and, uh, but I remember he had preached on this very passage one Sunday. And he tells the story. They were driving home in the family car. You know, three kids in the back seat. He and Martha in the front. Going to Elmo Heights where they live. And uh, Lisa, their daughter, was sitting in the middle in the back seat. And he could see her in his rearview mirror as they were driving home. And uh, so Lisa asked Buckner, her dad, a question. Daddy, today you preached on loving our enemies, right? He said, yeah, Lisa, I sure did. And she said, does that also mean that I have to love? And she mentioned the name of a little boy that she was in school with, whose name I cannot recall. And he said, yep, Lisa, that means we have to love him too. And I wish I could tell it the way Buckner did. He was looking at a rearview mirror and he said, she like shook her head like that. She said, no way. <laughs> you know, if we're really honest, we will be 
as honest as Lisa. Because there are some people in our lives, and let's go ahead, you can just bring up the picture of that person and bring him into the room with us or her, the no way one. The one to whom when Jesus says, love that enemy, you go, are you kidding me? And so let's work on this a little while. But let's, let's think, it is the 3rd of July. Tomorrow, 240 years ago, our forefathers, not just four of them, all of them, <clears throat> the Continental Congress, in fact, uh, declared our independence from England. And uh, that is what we're celebrating today with gratitude, great gratitude. And thank you for all of you who've done the decorations and flag and everything, the flags and everything. And, uh, you know, we thought we were all decorated well until Roy walked in. <laughs> if you've seen Roy's shirt, you know what I'm talking about. I thought I was patriotically dressed in red, white, and blue, but I got out there. But here's... Here's the country that we're thinking, thanking God for, okay? Two summers ago, I was in Germany. Don't know how many of you have been there. It's a beautiful, beautiful country. And I was, I marveled all, over all these magnificent, magnificent rock buildings, churches and castles and everything made out of stone. It was just incredible to me, these buildings. But then I was thinking back, wait a minute. After World War II, you know, Germany had been bombed from the west by the Allied forces and from the east by Russia, and it was just a pile of rubble. The country of Germany was just a big trash pile. And I was thinking, how in the world did these buildings not get bombed when all that World War II stuff was going on? And somebody told me, he said, oh no, they were bombed. They were all rebuilt. And do you know how they were rebuilt? The United States of America sent, spent $22 billion rebuilding Germany. Translate that to, you know, today's dollars, $182 billion. And this was something unprecedented in the history of mankind. You know, former enemies... Uh, you know, the, the practice in the past had been after you conquered a nation. We read about it in the Bible, conquered a nation. Well, there's widespread, sorry to use this word, rape and pillage and looting, sowing of salt in their fields so they would grow no more crops and on and on and on. But here we have a nation with her allies rebuilding the country that they had just bombed to obliteration. Unprecedented. God bless America. You know, that's why we started our service with that song. Did you know that song is a prayer? God bless America. That's a prayer. And, and we are praying that. I do pray that. We did pray that corporately, collectively. God keep on blessing us. Thank you for making us the kind of people that for the first time in the history of mankind, we loved our enemy after the war. Take it another case, Japan after World War II, same war. We've heard about the bombs. In fact, Buckner Fanning, who I mentioned a while ago, was in the Marine Corps, and he was with the first group of American soldiers who went into Japan after the surrender to help do what? Rebuild. Rebuilt it. Loved our enemies. And the United States spent $2.2 billion in Japan doing that. Translated to today's dollars, $18 billion. Loving our enemies. God bless America. That, that we may do the same. There was a, a professor at Texas A&M University who uh, in a literature class, and I've often called Texas A&M the most Christian campus, the most Christian college in Texas. I've been on all of them. And it is, there are over a hundred ministries uh, that the students are a part of at Texas A&M. So in this literature class, the teacher assigned that the, uh, that the students would read the Sermon on the Mount and write an essay, their response to this same message that we read a while ago. 
And one of the girls, you know, remember this is arguably, that really is the most Christian campus population in Texas. Even rivals are Baptist schools. It really does. And here's what a girl wrote. Many believe that this sermon should be taken literally. I believe, on the other hand, that because the scriptures have been interpreted from so many different languages, we should use them as a guide, not a law. Another fallback is certain Beatitudes are irrelevant to current lifestyles. Loving your enemies, for instance, is obviously not observed by the majority today. Since when did we let majority tell us what's the right thing to do? But that was at Texas a and in response to that, those three words, love your enemies. But this is not the only place in Scripture that's recorded. It wasn't just the message that Jesus repeated often. It's a theme that runs throughout Scripture. Go all the way back to Proverbs. Proverbs 24, 17 says this. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. And don't let your heart be glad when he stumbles. You know, don't gloat over that. Help rebuild. Matthew 5. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Sometimes when we read that, we think he's, that Jesus himself is quoting from the Old Testament. The first statement he is, love your neighbor. But the next statement, hate your enemy, that's not a biblical statement that Jesus was referring to. He was referring to modern day thought. You know, the people, even in the first century, thought that. Let's see, Romans chapter 12. This is a big one. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge. There's a good reminder, isn't it? Beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine says the Lord. I will repay. We don't have to. We don't have to. But if your enemy, here it goes, if he's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will hurt heap burning coals on his head. We're thinking, yeah, we finally get him. But no, what that that's a figure of speech. What that meant was, in doing so, See, back in those days, there was no t such thing as blue-tip matches. And uh, the way that most people started fires for their cooking and heating was from the coals from the previous fires. And they, I remember when I was a kid, my, my, we, would, we would put the ashes over the coals in the fireplace, so in the morning, they would be there. We'd relight, does that sound like I was born in a log cabin? You know, I guess it does, doesn't it? But uh, we would do that. We would put the ashes over the coals so that in the morning, they would be there, start a fire again. Didn't need a match, I had coals. But in what this is a reference to is sometimes if your fire would go out and the coals and everything, what would you do? You would borrow coals from a neighbor. And the way you would do that is you would and just like in Central America today, in Africa today, people carry things on their heads. In fact, there's a funny story about a missionary family came back from Africa where they'd been serving on furlough, and they were in the airport and picked up all their luggage, and they're walking out, and the mom and dad were walking in front, and they're wondering, why is everybody staring at us? And they turned around, and their kids were carrying their suitcases on their heads. Well, it's still done in a lot of the parts of the world today. One of the first, my first images of Guatemala when we moved there. Ladies walking down the street carrying things on their head, their baskets on their head. Well, heaping coals of fire on their head was a, a, a reference to that. You're doing them a favor. You're loaning them coals out of your fire. And so you're heaping coals of fire on their head. You're gifting them. You're treating your neighbors well. You're not being overcome by evil. Romans 12, 21. This is a verse that we could leave the room with. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. God bless America. That we would live that way. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity said this, Don't waste time bothering over whether you love your enemy. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as though you love someone, you will presently 
come to love him. What a great reminder. In other words, he's saying this. You know, if it doesn't feel like it, just play like you do. Pretend. Go through the motions. Do so with your actions, even if your heart's lagging behind. And if even if it's not sincere, because in the practice of doing... That, that's why Jesus said... You know, he didn't talk about attitudes. He talked about actions in this passage. Do these things. And in the doing of these things, then our heart will catch up with us. Man, I needed that. I needed, When I began my preparation last Sunday afternoon, I knew not only because this passage was so familiar, but because of this. Real quickly in my study, I kind of ran into a brick wall. And I knew, Robert, this isn't just you getting, you know, sharpening your pencil so you can you know, share something. I have a work to do in your heart first. And this is a message that has to take its place in you first. And then you will have something to say. Otherwise, you know, you might as well just bring a video and listen to somebody else talk. Yeah, just act like it. Go through the motions. Even pretend. C.S. Lewis went on. Uh, for if they, the other person is the enemy, if, if they are wrong, they need your prayers all the more. And if they're in your enemies, then you're under orders. We're ordered. Not a suggestion that we pray for them. Then that's when our heart starts catching up with our hands. When we've been going through the motions, then God softens our heart. And even that person who treats us like an enemy begin to see through that, man, they must really be hurting. What happened in their life that causes them to behave this way toward me? You know, softens my heart. Jesus on the cross. You remember what he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. You know, that we would so be impacted that our lives by Jesus himself, that even without trying to go through the motions first, but that then a response would start coming out of our heart, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That we would be able to love our enemies like this. The good news is it's not up to us, and that's you know, a little video deal that I did this week, you know, if it were up to me to be able to love my enemies, that's the title. Are you kidding me? But see, here's a really cool thing about Jesus among me. He never commands us to do something that he's not going to be able to do through us. And so it's not really an effort or in, even an acting or pretending. It's really in surrendering. Oh, Lord, I have a rotten heart. I'm so, I'm so sorry for the way I feel about this person. That, that my response, my initial response to them would be this. I still have a lot of work that you need to do. Surrender, surrender that you may do that. Oh, Lord, if I'm not loving my enemies, all that means is one thing. I still have a lot of work yet to be done in my life. But he won't ask us, tell us to do anything that he won't make it possible. That'd be cruel, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be cruel to me to send my kids on an errand that would be impossible for them to pull off? He won't do that either. He will do the surgery in our heart so that we can. Mm -hmm. Here's an appointment by a girl named Christine Kane. At some point, we have to make what Jesus did for us bigger than anything that someone else did for us. And when somebody's being ugly to me, that I would just remember, well, but Jesus, he loves me. That kind of balances it out, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm. John Piper put it this way, God saved me. You can go ahead and put that next slide up there, DJ. God saved me, think of the timing, while I was his enemy. And the origin of loving our enemy is the experience of being loved while we were his enemy. You know, the Bible says that we were all his enemies. All of us. And we are saved 
by a man who died loving us. Gave his life. And then Piper goes on, Our only hope for loving our enemy is to be a new creation in Christ. DJ, see that next slide if you would. New creation. So it takes us back to where we often end up on a Sunday morning, isn't it? Okay, I'm going to wave the white flag. I'm going to give up. I'm going to quit fighting. I'm going to give you access to do that kind of work in my life. Tim Keller, here's the acid test. If you're a Christian, you have a spirit. Get this. A spirit of wonder. Whoa. That permeates your life. You're always saying, how miraculous. (laughs) How unreal. We look at ourselves, and and, and I feel this. Me, a Christian, you know, incredible, miraculous, unbelievable. The work that he's doing, I have a long ways to go still. But I can look back and see, are you kidding me? I'm, I'm at least to this point, and he has already done at least this much work, already, much work already in my life. Man, I think he's going to keep on going. Just to wake with the wonder, we were in uh, Costa Rica, language school, little break room there. I may have shared this story before, but Jesus repeated himself too, so I will. And uh, um, my, my um, copy of Canadian Cattleman magazine came in the mail that day. And I was looking at my magazine and enjoying that. And, and I just told the guys in the room, said, y'all, just y'all wait your turn. After I finish reading Canadian Cattleman magazine, I'll pass it around and let you guys read it too. Of course, nobody in the room was interested in that except me. But uh, one of the guys in response to that, you know, these guys all knew Kelly. And he said, how did he end up with her? (laughs) How did we end up being called his children? Can you believe it? He calls us his, he adopted us. And he loves us so much that he, he really did. God, he really did. He died for us. And so if he loves me that much, I can start to get a clue about how I can love one who may mistreat me. A few stories. We love stories about people doing this stuff. So why don't we become stories of people who do this kind of stuff? Victor Hugo's. I don't, I don't know French at all. French is Greek to me. Uh, so how do you pronounce it? Les Miserables? You know that Les Miserables is the word. Okay, say it again. Okay, thank you. I was hoping somebody could help me. You know, it's Victor Hugo's you know, masterpiece. And uh, it's the story of a man who, got sent, who went to prison for 19 years because he stole a loaf of bread. And when he got out of prison, well, he was still a captive because nobody would hire him. He couldn't get a job because he was an ex-con. Until there was this one benevolent bishop who took him in. He gave him work and he gave him food and you know, gave him an opportunity to start life all over again. And guess what the man did back to the bishop? He stole the silverware and left at night. Well, the police caught the man this ex-con with the silverware and knew it wasn't, couldn't have been his and knew where, they knew where he'd been staying so they dragged him back to the bishop you know, with the silverware in tow and showed him, look, this man stole your stuff. Do you want to press charges against him? And the bishop said this, no, it was a gift. And the guy said, a gift? You gave this scoundrel your silverware? Yeah, I gave it to him. Well, the police left. And then he told the man, now you take that silverware and you go do something good with it. What did he do? He gave it back, to, gave a gift to his enemy, this young man. We love stories like that. That's why that one's still popular. Uh, show me that next picture up there. An illustration from the Amish. I'm going to read this. October 7, 2006, the son of Chuck and Terry Roberts, that's Terry, Shot ten Amish school children and then shot and killed himself. Five of the children died. 
as we, Chuck and Terry, sat at our breakfast table, sobbing, I looked through the window and I caught the sight of a stalwart figure dressed in black. It was our neighbor, Henry Stoltzfus, whom we'd known for years. He's an Amish man and was dressed in his formal visiting attire, wide brim hat. His friends and relatives' children were the shooting victims. He had every reason to hate us. Standing, striding up to the front door, he knocked, and as I opened the door, I saw that Henry didn't look angry. Instead, Compassion radiated from his face. Uh, opening the door, he walked over to my husband, Chuck, and he put his hand on his shoulder. The first words I heard, heard him speak took my breath away. Roberts, we love you. This was not your doing. Don't blame yourselves. The next day, a group of Amish leaders walked into the yard of her daughter-in-law the wife of the man who had killed their children. Every one of them had a family member who had died in the schoolhouse, but they didn't raise fists in fury. They reached to pull Marie's father into their embrace, and together the families and victims of the father-in-law of their killer wept and prayed together. But these weren't just words. The Amish insisted that part of the funds that had been donated to help in the funerals of all these children also go to help the widow of the man who had killed their children that would help her too. Loving with actions and in deeds. And on and on. There's more story to that. We love stories when we hear somebody loving their enemy because deep inside of us, God has put us a heart that longs to do that. You know, sometimes when I don't have it in me to do something, I've... I just try my best to follow somebody else's example. I know, know a man when I was in college, his name was Mr. Swinney, and he was the picture of a godly man, gentle, loving, giving. And I would think, if I act like Mr. Swinney, I'll be acting like Jesus. So that's why we love these stories. We, we get a picture of how to act on these words that Jesus said. Here's another Anybody seen the movie Captive? That's, this is the story. 2005, a, na na a man named Brian Nichols was on trial for rape. He escaped from an Atlanta courthouse after murdering four people. He forced his way into the a single mother's home, Ashley Smith. Next picture. Next picture, DJ. That's Ashley. Forced himself into her home and held her hostage for seven hours. Ashley diffused the situation by reading to him. She got Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, and began reading it to this man who was holding her hostage. The man who already killed four people was on trial for rape. And it diffused the situation enough that uh, she asked him, don't you want to just call the officials and turn yourself in and he said yeah I do you know what there's another thing about Ashley she wasn't even a Christian at the time she had visited her mother's church and they were giving away copies of that book and she picked it up and in fact she had thrown it away once and she got it back out of the trash but in reading it to this man who was holding her hostage the words of the book soaked into her heart and the subsequent weeks after, then she got saved. Man, love stories like that. One more. Go ahead and go to the next story. This is Pauline Jacoby. At a Walmart parking lot, a would-be robber forced his way in her van, uh, in her car, got in the passenger seat, and he, had, he told her he had a gun for her to give him all her, her money. The 92-year-old grandmother showed no fear when she tells the man, as quick as you hurt me, I'll go to heaven, but you'll go to hell. And she started witnessing to this man in her car. And as she did, tears started running down the man's cheeks. And he said, you know what? I don't think I want to rob you after all. And he reached over and he kissed her on the cheek. And he went to get out of the car. She said, wait, before you go, she gave him all the money she had. 
It was only 10 bucks. <laughs> but she said, here, this is the only money I have. Now, don't you go buy whiskey with it. <laughs> <laughs> Loving your enemies. Man. Story after story, I could keep on going. But let's just let's finish up by kind of getting personal. You know, to tell you the truth, I'm kind of like Gary Leonard and Rain. I haven't had much experience with enemies. I really haven't. I keep really good company. And most of the community and people that I spend my life with are loving people, Christian people. Until just this last year, there's a young man in our lives who we, five years ago, we began loving well. I say that before God. We gave to him. We included him in family activities and outings. And all the way to the extent, I invited him to shoot a deer at our family farm. Now, that's all the way out there, guys. That's as big a gift as you can give away. And a year ago, he turned on us. And you know, when I read this passage about Jesus, when he said, if somebody curses you, man, I know what that's like now. This young man used the most profane language with me that I've ever heard, cursing me. And we had done our best to love him well. And he told me this. He said, you have always been mean to me. And I'm thinking in my mind, I'm going down the list of things that we have done and given him. And I didn't say anything. And uh, by God's grace, I, I was able to turn the other cheek because I had been so loved by him and by others all my life. And so frankly, it was until just recently that I've even had any experience. You know, when Jesus said, love your enemies, he's not talking about those whom we've mistreated. He's talking about those who are mistreating us. Go back and look at the list. People who are mistreating us. And this is the young man that, frankly, last Sunday afternoon, when I started working on this passage, I had to go back to, Lord, how well am I doing here? How well am I doing loving him? You know, sometimes it's really, really hard. Really hard to love back. And the only way that I can, I'm not bragging on myself, I'm bragging on God. The only reason that I haven't retaliated is because of the work that God is still doing in my own life. So, I don't know who your enemy is. I don't know who it is who's mistreating you, who's cursing you, who's saying bad things about you behind your back, going to other people and saying things about you that are wrong. I don't know who that person is in your life. I have one in mind. And when I read these three words, love your enemies, I say, God, you're going to have to do that through me. Still really, really hard. So go on to the next slide and we'll finish with that. Are you kidding me? Me, love him. And Jesus says, not kidding. Not kidding. Okay, what if, and we'll conclude. What if... We did that. It wouldn't only change our lives. It would change Del Rio. The least of our worries would be filling up this room on Sunday mornings. We'll love our enemies. Do what Jesus said. And change the whole world. The whole world. Let's pray together. We have an opportunity to respond. Okay, Lord, thank you. Thank you that... For me this week, you brought this very, very familiar passage back to the forefront. You were able to touch my heart with it. Even this hard saying, love your enemies. And so, Lord, I know that if you can do that in me, you can do it in all of us. And I thank you. I thank you for doing that. Some of us need accountability. And uh, so if there's someone here who needs to be prayed with, about how to do that and doing that. I pray that they would be able to respond today because, Lord, we want to do it. We want to do what you said. We want to love our enemies. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.